This year, I think that the gaming world has sent a very clear message to the people who make them. And that message is, the customer is always right. Over the last six years or so, I think we have all together witnessed something that we love transform, mutate, and rot into something that we sometimes struggle to even recognize. And games have stopped feeling like something made with passion by people who wanted to play them and instead manufactured by companies who want you to buy them. But I remember a time where the driving force behind a game was that somebody had a cool idea and somebody else said, well, let's try it. And then suddenly we got a cool game. And today, more and more, it's become obvious that the ideas for games might still begin that way, but they are quickly sacrificed in the name of reporting massive profits to shareholders. They are neutered into playing it as safe as possible and marking every checkbox necessary to appease both a fictional audience and corporate overlords. The line of communication between us, the people who play games, and them, the people who make it, has been broken to a point where sometimes I question if it's even possible to repair it. But I feel like that's finally changing. At the end of the day, the judge, jury, and executioner here is the market, and the market has spoken. And so our message is ringing in the ears of the people who have the most power and the people who only speak one language, money. And look, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of great stuff in gaming, and we've seen awesome examples in the last years, which we're going to focus on in this video, of games that have listened to their customers, that are made with passion, and that have seen success. But I want to analyze a lot of those things so we can see a clear picture of where we're headed. The games that have been huge successes, the games that have been excellent but have failed to succeed as the publishers gaslight us, tell us that it's us, it's the customers who are wrong, and the games that have failed, or as the new term exists, uh, who have concorded. It's a message worth discussing and a message worth repeating, because this conversation about where gaming is headed is no longer about some idiot with a microphone in their bedroom. Sorry, I mean my palatial resort. This is about what the market wants. This is about passion, about creativity, about innovation, about making use of the tools that we have to create things that are better. And it's about how the trends reward those and not the subpar, checkbox marking, pandering games that fail. So this is a pretty complex topic and there's going to be a lot of things to discuss. There's some things that you might disagree with, but I think it's very much worth talking about. So hi, I'm Mug. I make videos on things that I care about and I hope you'll join me for this one. And I promise that by the end of it, you're gonna be feeling really good about games. I forgot to say like and subscribe, I'm a terrible YouTuber, I should quit. There was a time when the only objective of a video game was to be fun. The technology was new, the possibilities endless, and the chase for profit was more about finding a niche in the market, and eventually the money would come if it turned out that video games were indeed the next big thing. But a lot of that disappeared when different people started to get dollar signs in their eyes. You see, money has a way of clouding people's judgment, so at the end of the day, they were going to chase whatever could make the most money, and not the things that they wanted to do. But if there's anything worse than not making enough money, it's losing it. So it also meant that risks had to be eliminated from the equation as quickly as possible. And so we enter the modern gaming era, where a lot of our discussion has to take place in. Now this video is roughly divided into three parts. One examining failures, one examining the games in the middle that deserve success but couldn't find it, and the games that have found success. And that's precisely the order that we're going to cover them in. And so we have to start with games that are unoriginal, that offer nothing to players, but that do indeed check all of the boxes necessary for them to theoretically be successful. So you all know which one I'm talking about. It's Foam Stars. What happens when Square Enix has some money lying around and is thinking, hey, we should shoot our shot, why not? Okay, I'm kidding, we're gonna talk about Foam Stars in a bit, but there is just one big example that really shows absolutely everything that can go wrong. And I want to start with it, even though I've talked about it plenty before, I'm going to be brief this time, because it contains everything that then we're going to talk about with other games, but just they have one or two pieces of it. Yes, Concord is the biggest failure in video game history, at least 
you could argue that. I personally do. This is a Sony first party game with a huge budget. It's not on the same scale as other investments that have been made in the past and have failed. But just looking at the game, you know that from the very inception, it was misguided. It wanted to compete in the field of hero shooters by taking gameplay from Destiny, including ex-developers from there, and it took eight years to make it out to market. But taking a long time wasn't Concord's biggest crime. It was that in those eight years, they couldn't even copy the things that games had done eight years ago. Its universe, its gameplay, its maps, its characters, they can all be defined by one word. Uninspired. Because no, just ripping off somebody else's thing and slightly changing it, like it's that can I copy your homework, yes, but please change it a little meme. That is not inspiration. And while it is true that good artists copy and great artists steal, it turns out that if you're not good at doing those things, you maybe shouldn't do them. Concord really had pretty much everything that it could do wrong, done wrong. I'm serious, pretty much every single thing. And it is, no question, the reason why every single publisher under the sun is going to very heavily reconsider what they're investing in. But while it's emblematic of pretty much everything wrong in games, we're not here to talk about it. We're here to talk about how many of the things that are in Concord are also present in other games. Games that take another model that's successful, another art style, and they kind of blend a ton of different things together and expect to make money off of it. Yes, I'm now talking about Foam Stars. That game, I mean, I don't even know, you, you probably don't know what it is, but it's Splatoon, but with foam and made by Square Enix and with a kind of Fortnite-ish type of art style. And you see, the thing is, on paper, it makes sense, because Splatoon is very popular and very fun. It's a great game, but it's only on Nintendo consoles, so a ton of people can't play it. So if you at least do it more or less right, you can probably find an audience of people if you copy the game at least well enough, except that they didn't release it on PC or Xbox. Not even an Epic Games exclusive, just they, they didn't release it. But not only is Foam Stars just relatively uninspired and very similarly to Concord apt, it works correctly, but it just doesn't have soul. It just doesn't do the things that it's copying as good as the original to the point that I'm surprised that Square Enix picked this up from the developer Toy Logic, and I actually debated if this deserves to be in this category or the next one, but ultimately, even though it's fun and it's really good that somebody is trying to copy something other than the things we've seen copied a million times before, and most importantly, when your whole shtick is we're gonna do Splatoon, but not make it exclusive to Nintendo, and you make it exclusive to PlayStation, you kind of get what you deserve. Which leads me to example number three, Skull and Bones, the first quadruple A game. Okay, we all know why Skull and Bones is terrible. It's terrible for a million reasons, but a million different reasons. It is, honestly, kind of original. It's a live service concept that people really didn't expect. It just turns out that a lot of people weren't willing to invest in it. Looter shooter, but instead of shooter, it's pirate ships? That sounds good. But if I wanted my pirate fantasy fulfilled, uh, there's other things out there, including Sea of Thieves. So I guess I would play it for the Ubisoftication of the thing, but uh, I don't want to play a game for that reason. Which is a big deal. If a game is made or published by a company whose reputation is terrible, people aren't going to be excited for it. They're going to be, at most, very cautiously optimistic. So Skull and Bones had the originality, it just executed on it incredibly poorly because it's so safe in checking all of the boxes that a live service should have with its loot, with its events, with a concept that really doesn't fit the idea of a live service all that well, especially when, you know, Ubisoft, this is a trend that they have, by the way, of making games today that are worse than games they've made before. This is just the worst version of Assassin's Creed Black Flag. I can just go play that game and not worry about the live service element of it. Just like if I wanted an open world stealth exploration game, I could go play anything from Beyond Good and Evil up to a number of different Assassin's Creeds instead of playing Star Wars Outlaws and get better fundamental mechanics and a better game. But don't worry, Ubisoft is about to show up in the games that probably deserve success but failed for other reasons 
in just a second. Before we get there though, I think it's worth mentioning something like Helldivers 2. Helldivers 2 found incredible success, mostly because it deserved it. It does check the correct boxes in this case. It's original, it fits into a live service niche that really isn't very explored in PvE emergent co-op. It has the right tone, and it has more than enough personality to become a cultural icon, to be put on t-shirts and have people cosplay and even get tattoos. But I think it deserves to fall under the failures, at least for now, because they committed the cardinal sin. They didn't listen to their customers. Their most dedicated player base spent months and months and months telling them that they needed to stop nerfing everything, that they needed to stop nerfing every new weapon that comes in, that they needed to stop pre-nerfing weapons before they came in. Because it's a PvE game and people just wanted to have fun. People told them the reasons the game was getting boring and what they had to do to compensate for that. And when they finally listened, they took a little bit too long to do so and then kind of screwed it up as well. I wish for the best for Helldivers and I'm sure that Sony is really happy with how it performed the truth is that it's also a cautionary tale for everybody that we now know that a game like this at least has its value for that first month that we all enjoyed so much, but not necessarily for what it's going to do as a live service. I guess the lesson here is that if your game is just excellent right out of the gate, it doesn't matter if you squander your live service ambitions. You need to just be that good from the get-go. And of course, we can't forget about Warner Brothers Crown Jewel and Rocksteady putting out Slip and Slide Squad. God, I hate YouTube's rules about auto word detection, sensitive content warnings. Taking a property that people's overall feelings towards it is already lukewarm, and then turning it into some combination of Crackdown and Sunset Overdrive, which sounds really cool on paper, until you actually play it and you realize that it's as underwhelming as it looked at the start, and that it seems to be that its main goal was to exist as a live service so that the underwhelming amount of content that was there at launch, with its incredibly repetitive gameplay structure that we've grown so accustomed to with all of these live service games, it's just there so that they could continue adding content later. You know, the typical AAA video game trope these days of, you know, push it out the door, we'll fix it later, except the fixing it was kind of making it a whole game later. So not only did it look like a 7 out of 10 from the word go, but then the very low review scores and the horrible perception that people had from the game, from its narrative, from its gameplay loop, from pretty much everything, really left it struggling. But what is the most painful here is that this is Rocksteady. This is a developer that changed the game, one of the most important, arguably most influential developers of the last 20 years, thanks to basically just Batman Arkham Asylum. Considering the massive success of Hogwarts Legacy, a single player game without any dumb live service stuff attached to it, you would think they had grown out of their stupid pay to win phases that we had seen in stuff like Shadow of Mordor, for example, but no. In went Rocksteady into the live service dungeons, and Slip and Slide Squad was one of the largest financial failures, and from fan reception, one of the worst failures as well, that we had ever seen until, you know, Concord came around. And these are just the big ones. There's a ton of smaller projects that come out to try and survive and try and do the whole live service thing or try to compete by just being knockoffs of other things. But what we see more and more these days is that these huge projects that promise the world and promise that they're going to revolutionize everything with their quadruple A live service standards or whatever, just fail. And it feels great. But I think that covers a lot of the issues that games that fail these days have. From that lack of originality, that lack of passion, that feeling that they were designed by committee. It's like a control C, control V of just concepts, ideas, progression systems, and yes, battle passes and season passes, and it all just starts to feel the same for games that, on top of it all, a lot of them are live services, are games that become exhausting to even contemplate. You don't even want to think about getting involved in a new live service because you know all of the hullabaloo that comes attached with them, and it's just so goddamn annoying, man. 
even if the game is great, there's a lot of people that don't want to get invested into this stuff because it's such a commitment and there's so many of them already. It is really the losing gamble. But there can still be some pretty good ones. And I do want to highlight that just by making a live service doesn't mean that the game deserves to fail. That's one of the really important parts about Concord. That it came out and failed and for as many different things that people try and attribute that failure to, I don't think live service is one of them. We are currently seeing the success of Deadlock, Mecha Break, and Marvel Rivals seems to be incredibly promising, or at least I really enjoyed my time with it. It really does come down to the fact that live services in their own space abide by the same rules as everything else in games. You need to have that pinch of passion, that little bit of originality. If you're gonna copy, you gotta do it to the highest standard, and the game needs to be really good. And if you can do that, you can still have a successful live service. But if you're just copying and pasting, it's not gonna work. So speaking of live services that could work, but maybe don't... Welcome Ubisoft, come up on the stage. Let's talk about games that had the right idea, but just didn't know how to actually measure what their success would be. X Defiant! X Defiant is another one of those games like Concord or like Foam Stars that just seems to take the very ideas of another game, copies them wholesale, and adds a couple of twists and calls it a day. I like to call these games hashtag me too because they do the same thing as other games, but it's just like, yeah, me too. What's that? I'm being informed that hashtag has already been used, so come up with something better in the comments. Thank you. And I've defended many times before that copying a really good game isn't easy. And many games that we'll talk about in, in a bit later copy and do an excellent job at it. And X Defiant, to be honest, does. It nails the Call of Duty feeling pretty much as well as you could without being Call of Duty. Or at least a, a version of it. There's a lot of Call of Duty. It adds a little bit of a hero shooter faction thing into the mix, but its biggest selling point always was no skill-based matchmaking. Something that the hardcore Call of Duty community, and even a little bit of the broader community, is very aware of. The idea that you are always going to be matched with opponents that are similar in skill to avoid you getting stomped or as most people for some reason believe they would always do, stomp. How did the saying go? I, I forgot the saying. Remind yourself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So the developers behind X Defiant said, okay, that's what you want, we'll give it to you. And they did. And they made a really good game in the process. It just turns out that it doesn't have any of the years and years and years and manpower that Call of Duty has to pump out so much content, to pump out all of these quality of life features, to just be the behemoth that it is. And by the way, Call of Duty can do a lot of that because it makes so much money, so it can have so many people to pour resources into making stupid skins that I don't understand how people want. But more importantly, into adding two to three new guns every couple of months and a couple of new maps to have Warzone exist, to have all of the things that Call of Duty does. And yes, I'm talking about things that are there for free. No matter how many allegations of pay to win might exist, the truth is that there is a ton of content included for no additional price to people who buy Call of Duty. And they use that money to, to make more money, but they do provide things, okay? X Defiant just can't compete with that, and it's a free-to-play game. But its biggest downfall was really overestimating how many people were truly that excited and willing to commit to a different Call of Duty competitor just on the basis of the skill-based matchmaking being eliminated. Because it turns out that a lot of the people who had complained about SBMM still prefer the quality of life and the amount of content present in Call of Duty, but also there's just not that many people who really gave a damn. And so the player base dwindles and dwindles pretty much every month, and it's really not helped by the fact that it is locked on Ubisoft Connect. Because what even is Steam? Let's be honest. Speaking of which, man, Square Enix has been making some pretty great single-player RPGs with no bullshit in them. And 
signing exclusivity deals for PlayStation. Oh no! Watch out! Mug Thief complaining about PlayStation, the platform who has had one really good game this year and it might as well be game of the year. Oh no! Here comes Mug Thief, the Xbox shill who doesn't own an Xbox. <laughs> to talk trash about PlayStation? No! I'm not going to talk trash about PlayStation. I'm gonna let Square Enix do that. <laughs> okay, so they didn't talk trash about PlayStation, but they did say that they were no longer going to sign exclusivity deals because it turns out that it doesn't matter how much money PlayStation or the Epic Games Store, which I will remind some of you, for the last five years, Kingdom Hearts was locked to the Epic Games Store. It wasn't on Steam. Sorry, it's just, it's a personal thing. It hurts so much. It just very honestly does not compensate. And with games that are smaller in budget and scope that have been exclusives, they have managed to find success, but they would have found more if they were multi-platform. And that's just becoming a reality. And this is the part that I never understood from Square Enix's deal with PlayStation. If you're a smaller studio like Shift Up putting out your first big game, it makes sense that the security net the marketing deals and the funding that Sony can provide would benefit you and it would have you a lot more confident about what could happen later down the road or how bad this investment could end up when you're actually taking a risk. And it's one of the reasons that I do respect some developers for taking Epic Game Store deals. Similar to Game Pass, they get a lot of money up front and guaranteed no matter the results of the game. But a company as big as Square should have known from the start that the moment that you announce exclusivity for a PlayStation, even if it is the best-selling console on the market, you're still locking yourself out of so many sales. But not just that, you're locking yourself out of so much word of mouth, so much attention, so much potential. Let's not kid ourselves. If a really good-looking game that everybody is saying is awesome is on a platform that you don't own and you're not willing to own because the economy is what it is, are you going to sit there and listen to people talk about how great it is? Or are you just gonna tune everything about it out? And when you think about it that way, how many people are going to stream your game? How many people are going to make videos about it? How many people are going to talk about it here and there? Because I have personally started conversations about PlayStation exclusives with friends and the moment that they ask me, wait, isn't that the PlayStation game? And I say, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't give a shit. While my one other friend who has a PS5 will be like, oh yeah, I heard it was cool. And so Square has been in limbo between PlayStation and Epic and has now decided that it's just not good for them. And that is a very big part of the reason that games like Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 have struggled. And it's part of the reason why I think that their future games won't because they do make great games that everybody wants to talk about at the very minimum and that many people want to play. It's just that putting that exclusivity deal on them makes them so much less accessible. That, that's, how, that's how the exclusivity thing works. But it's just another win in giving customers what they want because I think that most customers, unless you are just so absolutely committed to your loyalty to a plastic box that you dislike the idea of other people enjoying something. We want to play great games wherever we enjoy them the most, when possible. I'm sorry Nintendo Switch, you're getting old. But what I really wanted to highlight with the successes that haven't found that much success part of this video is that success is very relative. This is why the indie game space thrives so much, because even higher budget indie games, the ones that retail for 20 or $30, and the rise of games that are double A, so even if they do sell their games for full price, their budget and overall costs were a lot lower, they can find success at lower numbers. They can find resounding success at lower numbers that these other companies simply can't. So there is the whole conversation around expectations versus the final results. And that leads me to chapter 2.5, gaslighting us. Sorry, quick thing. I, I had to answer the phone and I just quickly, since I had to get out, uh, checked the news and the PS5 Pro was announced. The fact that Sony is going to 
try and tell us that we wanted no disk drive in a $700 console before tax? That's, that's gonna fit in the gaslighting thing really well. Sorry, sorry, good stuff, coming soon. Within the examples of games that should have probably succeeded if their expectations were in check, we have a lot of cases of developers telling us that we are wrong. And yes, we have to tie this back into some of the previous examples as well. This is actually a really big problem. Last year, EA released Immortals of Avium under their label for partnerships. It is a single player FPS where instead of using guns, you use magic. It's like Hexen, but new. And it's exciting and cool, but it also kind of looks terrible from the cutscenes. It doesn't look that interesting. Kind of a game that's a little bit too in love with what it's presenting. But hey, it's something new, it's original, and probably worth supporting. However, EA decided to do absolutely terrible marketing for the game, and maybe they should have fixed the, the title of it, made it a little bit catchier. And if they were going to spend a lot of money on marketing, maybe they shouldn't have spent it on a Mr. Beast video. I'm serious, they actually had ads for this placed in a Mr. Beast video. One final thing I need to throw in the mix is Immortals of Avium. The sponsor of this video. Just hold that right there. Okay, perfect. Yo, look at that. That looks crazy. Which is definitely the demographic that you want. Yeah, I'm sure that children that watch Mr. Beast are here just excited to play a single player, full price, magic-based first-person shooter, huh? So at the end of the day, not many people knew that Immortals of Avium existed, and as you might imagine, it didn't sell particularly well. To which EA came out and said, We don't understand. Gamers keep telling us that they want no live services, that they want single player games, and we gave them one, and they didn't buy it. Turns out we might be right, and what we should do is make another mediocre, unfinished version of Battlefield that we'll patch later on. Guys, we gave you Mass Effect Andromeda, and you didn't like it. That's your fault. You said you wanted more Mass Effect, and we gave it to you, but since you didn't like it, we're not gonna give you any more. <laughs> This idea of developers making every single wrong decision that they could make while having just unrealistic expectations of what the results should be for a type of game and then blaming customers for their failure as an excuse kind of to say this is why you're gonna keep getting live service games and you're gonna eat them. You're gonna eat them has now kind of become a trend. Ubisoft, not as explicitly as the information we have from Immortals of Avium, kind of did the same thing with Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, which if you're still finding out that there was a new 2D Metroidvania Prince of Persia game released by Ubisoft this year, developed by the same team behind Rayman Legends, and that it is in fact excellent and might still be on my top 10 list for the year. Welcome to the club. Turns out not a lot of people found out. But how come? Well, because the first time it was announced, a lot of people didn't like the music because they just used generic kind of rap music in the background while well, the protagonist has that one haircut that every single black character needs to have in video games now. It also wasn't clear if this was like a full-sized game in the sense. It kind of gave a little bit of uh, Xbox Live Arcade vibes to some people, so... Was it going to be a $60 game? And then from there, the release date cycle wasn't very well organized, so the game just kind of came out, and a lot of people didn't hear about it. And it was indeed released for $60 when Ubisoft never really communicated to anybody why it would be worth it. Especially in a genre that has heavy competition from the indie scene at much lower prices and at exceptional quality. And to top it all off, it's Ubisoft, so it wasn't released on Steam. Just on principle, I bought the game on Switch. So after a disaster in marketing and communication, and nobody knowing that the game even existed, what did Ubisoft tell us all? We don't actually want single player games without battle passes. We don't want new original creative games because they did everything that they could. They put their best team arguably to make a new Prince of Persia and nobody bought it. So obviously the failure was that it, it should have been a live service Prince of Persia game because the brand recognition is still definitely there. It's just that people don't want single player games. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You're definitely right. You're so in touch with everything, Mr. Ubisoft. 
Of course, we have the usual stuff. We have an ex-developer from Concord calling people talentless freaks and attributing the failure of the game to the culture wars. Uh-huh, the culture wars definitely took down Baldur's Gate 3. Uh-huh, same deal. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the game, or more specifically, the fact that the art design in the game is garbage. And despite all of these things, the people behind Concord will keep attributing its failure to people being mean, essentially. To customers feeling entitled to getting a product that they enjoy for the money that they put down. The same customers that are frequently belittled and called bigots and told that their opinions don't matter because games aren't for them. And let me be honest here, there are games that aren't for everybody. And I think that they should exist because they are for someone. But the market is the judge, jury, and executioner. The market will decide if they're viable. The market will decide if they can make their money back. The market will tell us if there's an audience for them. But what you can't do is look at a very large segment of people, whether you agree with them or not, and say that their opinion and their concerns are not relevant. I fiercely disagree with a lot of people that identify with whatever that side of the culture wars is. And I fiercely disagree with people on the other side of the spectrum, including certain corporations that have provable cases of being absolute scumbags out to make money by ruining video games. And I can disagree with both of them, but I would never tell anybody that their opinion as a paying customer is irrelevant. And I definitely don't think it's a smart business decision to take what a group of people buy or don't buy and try and twist that into whatever narrative I want to justify my investments into what is statistically the highest potential return on investment and therefore the best gamble to take even if it means forcing another video game to exist that only checks boxes and doesn't actually do anything special and so we reach the games that actually do things that are special baldur's gate 3 independent studio reviving a genre that many people ignored even though it's still been Alive and kicking. Thank you, Owlcat Games, by the way. Like, for existing, I mean. But really putting in the AAA budget and effort into a monumental game that's still just hard to even think about how difficult it was to write and plan around. And its massive success proves that CRPGs aren't outdated. It's just that for a while, people just made more money doing other stupid things. But the genre is alive and well because excellent quality games never die. And good game design is forever. Lies of P showed us that if you are great at stealing, you can steal a heck of a lot. Put a fresh coat of paint, put in your own ideas, and make a game that in quality rivals what you're stealing from. The only reason Lies of P didn't get even higher scores is because it didn't have From Software's name attached to it. Stellar Blade is a gotcha game developer taking their money and investing into another market the AAA premium game. No season pass, no battle pass, no weird microtransactions, just a complete game of, again, excellent quality and proving that you can be sustainable at it. Black Myth Wukong showing that China does have the developers that wants to compete in a space that for the culture, for what China has been historically, isn't really there. Single player AAA instead of mobile games in China? Well, turns out, they want it, and turns out we're going to get more of them. Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2, a smallish developer, Saber, who really cut their teeth on World War Z, uh, as well as some other things, but coming out swinging with something that really can play with the big boys and brings back a type of package that we hadn't seen in a very long while. I mean, technically Call of Duty still follows the same system, but not a lot of big games are trying to emulate the whole campaign, co-op, and PvP side of things in the same way, and they came out swinging with a game that at its core is innovative and incredibly well made. And that's ignoring slightly smaller games, be that Core Keeper or Dredge or Pal World, one of the largest successes we've seen that again, like Lies of P is a great example of how you can take something, steal it, and in the case of Pal World, modify it more change it into a genre that actually blends perfectly with the creature collecting thing and is really smart in its design and just have a breakout hit. 
And of course, Sony is capable of tremendous success as well, as Astrobot proves. But it is a phenomenal game. And for as much as we might say it, they're just copying Nintendo, again, that's not easy. And they did put in their part to make it stand out more than many Nintendo games in some cases. Even if the Nintendo magic is still there, and you can still count on them as one of the best examples of the whole, the customer is always right, and innovation, originality, trying new things and having developers actually make them with a passion will always be successful. And this is why I feel that things are going well. The indie scene is exploding like never before as more and more studios can grow and as AA reappears and we're seeing AAA studios take notice of this. Uh, people who follow my channel already know, they can say it with me, but Sony, Sony under previous plans, who had 12 live services planned and then cut them down to 6 and Concord is the second of the 6. And I don't think anybody's gonna try and imitate that whole Sony plan ever again after Concord. But that has me feeling good, that people are going to recognize what it takes, because the biggest risk, let's have some real talk for a second here, the biggest risk of trying something that is truly original, and putting passion in it, is that sometimes you're either not going to meet the quality necessary to really break out, or your expectations are too high, or you just won't get the eyes necessary to ever reach your audience. And that's what happens to a ton of indie games. Sure, some get lucky and there's word of mouth or smaller publishers that have a following, things like Devolver or New Blood, and you end up listening to what they put out and always curious, and they do find a way and they do find success. Most importantly, that success is sustainable for them because of their budget and their expectations. But other games just don't have the quality even if they have the passion, or again, they don't reach their audience. But the part that I fail to understand in all of this, and the part that really needs to change, is that it's the biggest studios, the biggest publishers, that have the money to truly invest into passion projects, into original things that should find success because they can force it into the eyes of people. And it's also true that when they do that, Prince of Persia, Pentiment, Obsidian's game, including Chris Avalon from Fallout New Vegas fame, absolutely fantastic game. When they do try and put it in front of people, they just don't know how to market it. They spend all this money forcing it into people's eyes, but they never tell us what it is or why we should be excited for it. Because they never present the passion that really matters in those projects when they have the budget to get it in front of people. But then they'll just blame us. What they should be doing is have just absolutely incredible games that ooze that originality and that passion. And then spend enough money to just put a great game in front of us. You know what always sells video games? Just give us gameplay that looks spectacular in some way or another and people will 100% wishlist that. But for some reason, we need 35 presentations about stuff we don't care about, instead of just proving to us with images that this is clearly a game that had people who wanted to make it. But I think now, now is really the wake-up call for the big studios out there. But if there's two things that I want you to take away from the picture I've painted, from how the games that don't deserve success aren't finding it. How some games that deserve it are being fumbled in other ways and their failures being attributed to us. And how the final group of games are just truly successful. It's that passion is contagious. We feel the passion that developers put into their games. We feel through their inspirations and the things that those games remind us of. We feel it through how much innovation is put into them, how much they're willing to surprise us, to make us smile, or to offer us an experience that's unique. And that passion turns into communities. It turns into fan art. It turns into YouTube videos. It turns into TikToks. It turns into people wanting the game to succeed and enjoying it. And the second thing I want you to take away from this is that it isn't pie in the sky ideas. These companies are seeing failures. And it doesn't matter how they try to spin it, or how they get out of the hole that they've made, or if they are just so impossibly large at this point that they don't even care. 
They are suffering consequences for their actions. Ever since I was a kid, I've heard people say that you need to vote with your wallet. I've heard it in pretty much every industry imaginable. And I've seen that not be true. I've seen people not vote with their wallet or vote and the results not matter. But now, this time, we're being heard. And while we won't notice the effects for a while still to come, you can be really damn certain that it will have an impact. This isn't about us, people who are constantly online, speaking about games, watching videos on them. You don't have stock prices plummet unless everybody agrees. You don't have games like Concord closing after 14 days unless everybody agrees. This is beyond our bubble and we're going to see that continue to impact things in the future. And for the first time in a very long time, I believe that the best days of video games are ahead of us. Where from the incredibly successful, brilliant indie games that I've enjoyed throughout this year, to niche titles that are still made with love and passion, be that your Unicorn Overlords or your Earth Defense Force 6s, all the way to the highest budget, most prolific studios and publishers out there. Things are going to change for the better. And the money, as it always should be, is aligned with the best quality, with things that consumers want. I am incredibly excited for the future of games. And I've played a ton of games this year that I can't wait to talk about more in depth that I think many people will love. The state of AAA games and the state of a lot of indie games as well might be this misguided attempt at checking all of those boxes, at doing things that are supposed to be good, at getting good boy points and expecting people to clap. But there are plenty of games all over the spectrum from heartfelt indies that do talk with real representation about issues that people care about. And there are big AAA experiences that are true to what they want to be and tell marvelous stories. There are amazing live service games that are coming into the market and offering experiences that are new, addictive, and just a ton of fun. And while gaming is the biggest that it's ever been, it's still smaller than what it's going to be over the next year. Good games will never die, and they will continue to be successful, because that's just how things work, and I'll be here to play them all. Thank you for watching. Ever since I was a kid, the thing that I've wanted to do is talk about the things that I love, especially video games. I dreamed of working at one of those publications like GameSpot or IGN, because that's all we knew back then. And video games are a bigger part of my life today than they ever have been. And that's thanks to you watching these videos. The fact that you're watching is a dream come true. And I have huge plans for the channel that I'll be talking about really soon. And if there's one thing that you can always expect here, it's me. Authentic, with my opinions, no matter if they're popular or not. And hopefully, something that's entertaining and makes your day better. Also, I do not accept trips to Disneyland in exchange for good coverage of games. That's, that's important, Elsa. But truly, thank you. And a very special extra thanks to the members of the $1 patron wall. If you're interested in supporting what I do, check out the link in the description. This was a really tough video to write and to do on camera and to edit and a bunch of things. So uh, if you did enjoy it, if you like this sort of thing, make sure to leave a like. And if you want more from me, subscribe. And as always, I'll see you again very soon.